So good evening and welcome to our fifth and final online conversation in connection with Interpreting the Natural, Contemporary Visions of Scholars Rocks. It's the group show that's currently on view at the Korean Cultural Center in New York. Tonight's talk, presentation, arrangement and display where Scholars Rocks and contemporary curatorial trends converge. We'll focus on the traditional presentation and display of Scholars Rocks as a metaphor of current curatorial trends in the field of contemporary art in the United States and the East Asian diaspora. This meeting is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube in a few days on the Korean Cultural Center's website and YouTube channel. For those of you not familiar, we are very grateful to the Korean Cultural Center for hosting the exhibition and the online dialogues. The Korean Cultural Center of New York is a government institution that opened in 1979 to promote Korean culture and aesthetics in the United States. It's a branch of the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism of Korea, and it supports diverse artistic activities, including gallery exhibitions, performing arts concerts, film festivals, and educational programs. The current exhibition is part of the center's annual Call for Artists program that presents the work of talented artists and curated exhibitions at Gallery Korea each year. And we'd love to share a short video with you to briefly demonstrate what the Korean Cultural Center of New York does. And tonight, I'd like to introduce a special guest that we have with us today. Executive Director Yoon Jung Jo of the Korean Cultural Center would like to share a few welcoming remarks. Hello, everyone. I'm the Executive Director of Korean Cultural Center, and my name is Yoon Jung Jo. And um, thanks so much, Donna, for your kind introduction. Mm, I'm so happy to be able to join this last Zoom session to thank all the participating artists and experts who have made this exhibition so special, despite the difficult situation we are facing. I'm happily surprised to see so many people eager to join the previous sessions from all around the country, even as far as from Los Angeles to share their experience and expertise on Scholar's Rocks and his inspiration on contemporary arts. Uh, there has been drawbacks to not having in-person participation, but also a huge gain in accessibility for the audience uh, thanks to successful online programs and discussions. For us, this event was a new start for the future and how we are going to navigate the role and the function of our gallery. We are completing our own building with a new expanded gallery and a concert hall in mid Manhattan late next year. And we are further waiting in on American artists involvement in the arts to broaden our horizon. Once again, I appreciate your hard work and sincere participation, and I hope to see you again on another occasion not far from now. So I wish all the best and take good care of yourselves. And, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. And the honor, the flow is yours. Thank you, Director Joe. Those are really beautiful remarks. And I share your aspiration that some of these turbulent times are um, fading onto the horizon. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our very distinguished guest that we have with us tonight. Jin Stewart is the Melvin R. Seiden Curator of Chinese Art at the National Museum of Asian Art in Washington, D.C. She holds degrees from Princeton and Yale Universities in Chinese Art, Language, and Culture. In 2018, 
2019, she co-organized Empresses of China's Forbidden City, 1644 to 1912, with Daisy Yiyu Wang at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, the Travel to the Peabody Essex Museum in Massachusetts, and the Palace Museum in Beijing, China. Stewart was awarded the Secretary of the Smithsonian's Research Prize for the catalog. She's the author of Where Chinese Art Stands, a history of display pedestals for rocks in Robert Mowry's publication, Worlds Within Worlds, Chinese Scholars Rocks. Also with us tonight are two artists in the exhibition, Chris Frost, a sculptor living and working in Somerville, Massachusetts. His work has been exhibited and collected in museums and art institutions throughout New England. Frost's indoor and outdoor sculpture is part of many private and corporate collections. He completed his undergraduate studies at Bates College, the Parsons School of Design, and in Paris, France. Chris received a master's degree from the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. He received a Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowship in 2009. Currently, he's a lecturer in fine arts at Brandeis University in Waltham, Massachusetts, and a member of the Boston Sculptors Gallery. Also with us tonight, Susan Meyer, whose work is in the exhibition. She's based in Hudson, New York. Meyer has exhibited throughout the United States at venues, including the Albany International Airport Gallery, the Hunterdon Art Museum in Clinton, New Jersey, Markle Fine Arts in New York City, the Hyde Collection in Glens Falls, New York, the Albany Institute of History and Art in New York, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, Colorado, the Center for Visual Arts in Denver, the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, Art Space New Haven, and the Islip Art Museum and Carriage House in New York State. Artist residencies include Sculpture Space, Anderson Ranch Art Center, U Cross, and Pilchuck. Meyer is an Associate Professor of Art at the Center for Art and Design of the College in St. Rose in Albany. And also with us tonight, we have Craig Yi, a founding director of Ink Studio, a Beijing-based gallery and experimental art space devoted to documenting and exhibiting Chinese, China's leading contemporary ink artists. Mr. Yi's writings have appeared in a number of monographs including the phenomenology of life on the multimedia practice of Wang Zhiyang's studio. Also another publication, Impulse Matter Form on the ink abstractions of Zheng Chongbin and Carving the Unconscious on the artist Chen Haiyan. Mr. Yi has also played a central editorial role in university and museum research projects on classical and modern Chinese painting, including at the Honolulu Academy of the Arts, the Central Academy of Fine Arts in Beijing, and the University of Hawaii Press. So thanks everyone for joining us. And we'd like to start with Jan Stewart's remarks. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak. And I'd like to thank director Joe and the Korean Cultural Center for this fabulous exhibition. Our topic, as you know, and in fact, Donna, maybe you could put up my first slide sure. um, if you don't mind. The topic, as you know, is presentation, arrangement and display. Where scholars, rocks and contemporary curatorial trends converge. Actually, I think Donna would be the best speaker for this, having just created this fascinatingly rich exhibition. But she very kindly invited me to speak and to speak from the, the perspective of knowing Chinese art. Now, my research is in Chinese art, um, and I have been a curator for my whole professional life. So I think I'm that convergence um, embodied in a human being. Um, but as much as I admire the artworks that I've seen online that are in the exhibition, because I haven't physically seen the show, I've decided tonight just to talk about rocks and artists that I know personally. What you're seeing uh, in the title slide 
I think is a quick uh, gloss to what is so much of contemporary curatorial practice, putting something modern in dialogue with something traditional. This was an exhibition last year in Beijing uh, in the Fusion Gallery, which has a traditional Sujo style gallery and has scholars rocks. Uh, and here is the modern artist, Shui Gyun Guo's um, metal rock. And I thought just to start, I would quote something that he said about this exhibition. Quote, these natural things that have been silenced in the passage of time and artifacts generated by technical means remind us in the current age of contemporary trends that are increasingly technological, but we can learn from nature and we can use it to turn technology into art. So I thought that was a thought provoking way to look at a actual rock and an artist's interpretation of a rock. Next, please. I'm going to give you a very quick history lesson. And if I were rating myself on display, I'd say I have way too many images on the screen, but hopefully I can connect them for you quickly. So I think everyone attending this talk is well aware of the power of Chinese rocks. Uh, they've been described by the scholar John Hay, I think in a very great way, as a kernel of energy and a bone of the earth. They are worn by wind and water, they are shaped by sedimentary and igneous processes, and in fact, a well-selected rock is an encapsulation of cosmic force it holds the power of transformation. As you've been following, it fits into Confucian ideologies. The humane um, take pleasure in mountains and by analogy, all rocks. It fits into Taoist philosophies of being one at, with nature, but also of the quest for immortality since immortals live in cavernous mountains. And if you have a craggy rock, you might attract an immortal's attention to aid you on your own quest. So we have all these philosophic resonances with rocks. We have aesthetic formal considerations of looking at their shapes. But how do you take a rock that you find in nature and transform it into something above the mundane? How do you make it really special? Well, that I would say is through display. And the power of display to mediate an object and how we receive it is just critical. So we know that the earliest uh, displays of rocks in China, they were put in basins, often with plants. Now this is, this is a late painting, I mean late as in uh, 16th century, but it's reproducing a style of displaying rocks and plants together in ceramic and metal basins and making uh, a garden that you bring in to put on your tabletop for contemplation. You see on the far left, this is a reproduction. It's an ink cake actually, but it is reproducing what we read that one of the most important 12th century collectors uh, said about displaying his rocks, that he would put them in a basin filled with pebbles and that would hold the craggy rock and it would be a, a wonderful environment for it. But gradually, and especially by the 15th century, you began to have rocks placed on wooden stands. So I'm showing you three uh, examples here. The very tall one would topple over if it were just stuck in a basin, unless it were like really deeply in the basin. So instead stands were constructed. If you see the knobs, if you can put your cursor on the stand of the tall rock, you see the knobs there. Those are a way in wood of reproducing. Uh, the pebbles. So it's kind of evoking the original context. And if you look at the Y-shaped rock, um, just to the right there, look at its stand. Its stand looks like branches 
Well, look at the painting next to it. It's a camellia next to a rock. So the branch that you might see in a landscape garden, you can capture that feeling and put it in rock stands. So you have this very elaborate, complicated set of displays. Now I'm almost out of time. So quickly, next slide, please. I just want to remind you that how you hold a rock and display it is critical. The Chinese in the, in the Ming Dynasty talked about rocks as playthings. They talked about many arts as playthings because that tactile dimension is important. But if you have the rock placed properly like it is on the left, you can imagine something majestic. For us, we might think of Henry Moore. I don't know what they thought of in the Ming, but it looks right but put it like it is on the right. And my God, it's some kind of ugly duckling struggling to swim. So I'm just reminding you um, of how important it is to look at rocks. Now I'm going to very quickly show two more slides. You're doing fine, Jen. Okay, here we go. Here, I wanna take us to the contemporary. I'm looking at ink paintings by the master artist Liu Dan, still practicing, very active in Beijing, and two ways that he's responded to a rock. If you look at the far left, we have an actual rock that is in a garden at the Sackler Museum in Peking University. Next to it, you have a gigantic painting that is his portrait of the rock. And it has a long colophon that tells us the history of the rock. Now, I'm asking you as an audience, do you want to see those two things together? He did not make them to be seen together. And then I want to pull your attention to the right, where you see Honorable Old Man is the name of this rock in the uh, Richard Rosenblum family collection. And this rock was responded to by Liu Dan, who made ink paintings, nine different views of the rock, and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts has displayed them together. So you as the viewer are going back and forth with the power of the rock and the power of the art. Now, one thing I wanna draw your attention to that Liu Dan tends to do when he makes these meticulous studies and reinterpretations of rocks. Do you notice how he cuts off the base? He starts without the stand. The stands are display techniques that make the rocks sculpture. Liu Dan is creating an image of the mind. He uses ink so beautifully. He layers it on the paper, but it's ethereal, it's light. His rocks are a mind image. And so as a curator, the gigantic painting in the center, I want to display without the real rock there but I want you to know they're both. Now to conclude, I bring you to another contemporary artist, uh, Jen Wong, who is well known, next slide please, who is well known for these fantastic uh, stainless steel rocks. And I have a lot going on in this slide. On the left is a giant size rock, Rock 59, that was displayed at the British Museum when I was keeper of Asia there. And he creates rocks with a stainless steel uh, surface because the stainless steel reflects what's above and next to it. It is constantly dynamic and in flux, just the way the cosmic power of a rock should be. But he's reflecting the modern world. So you see the sky of the British Museum uh, when you look at the upper right reflected. And you see how the rock is there where the light hits it and it disappears when the light's not there. It's a very, very evocative experience. At the same time, I displayed this rock in a totally separate room, I displayed his photographic series called New Chinese Garden, in which he used digital technology to superimpose his rocks into a real traditional garden. He replaced the real rocks with a stainless steel in order to make the comment that perhaps in today's world, there is no place 
for a geological specimen. We have replaced nature with concrete and glass and mirrored steel. So he's asking you, he's pushing and pulling at you, what is a modern rock? And in the end, I conclude by saying that I think what Jian Wang is after is to take a new concept and insert it into nature, to leave you questioning what is man's relationship to nature through the powerful form of a rock. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. That was very thought provoking. And um, I think we'll dive deeper maybe during the q and I think now um, Chris Frost is gonna make some remarks and share his work with us. <clears throat> Hello everyone, good evening. Uh, again, a thank, big thanks to everybody, especially the Korean Cultural Center in New York uh, wonderful to be a part of this exhibition in this space and having the center support us and a giant thanks to Donna Dodson for curating and doing all the work that um, goes into putting on a big exhibition like this and putting together this series. Um, I just am going to give a real brief kind of uh, introduction um, to my sculpture and specifically those that sculpture that is uh, has been influenced by scholars rocks and um, I would just start out by saying you know when I, I was introduced to scholars rocks when I was younger um, there was a, a rock in a Chinese restaurant where I lived and saw it as a young child and then that just spurred interest and led to um, investigation on my part, you know, museum visits, uh, purchasing books and the like. And I think the thing that really has always appealed to me about um, the scholars rock in general is, is especially from a sculptural and artistic point of view, uh, is that idea of um, form, three, three ideas in general, form certainly, and then material. And, you know, these two kind of work together, you know, creating sculptural characteristics like texture and uh, density and color and the like. And the third one is this conceptual uh, relationship of the rock to nature. And um, that relationship I think is, is key um, this kind of, you know, the, the scholar's rock, the bonsai, uh, Asian gardens, this idea of like the perfect nature, that kind of uh, tranquility, that, that, that simplicity, um, that has always drawn me in. Um, and in a way kept me from, in, you know, putting that kind of ideal into my work. It just seems so heavy and so perfect. Um, but uh, in about 2012, I had an opportunity through a traveling scholarship to um, go to China and um, visit the site, this place where, um, you know, the birth of the scholar rock and see them in location as to uh, have they been presented over the hundreds of years. Um, so it was a wonderful trip. And what came out of it was this ability for me to interact my own thoughts and my own work. And so at that point, after this trip, and uh, I, I, I got the realization of how I can, you know, bring those ideals of the scholars rock into my own work. Um, so if I could have that first slide, Donna. Yes. So if you look at this image, um, you can actually take your hand and kind of block it over that lower photograph. And if you focus on that, uh, upper garden photograph, which I believe is um, uh, Suzhou, a garden in Suzhou. Um, this is what I, this is the ideal that I expected I would be seeing all over. And I'm, you know, I'm not naive to think that this is what China was, but this is what was in my mind. And indeed, I did find these locations and went to numerous places. But then, of course, I'm also experiencing the photograph below, which is Nanjing Street in Shanghai, which is this is the way the world is. It's modern. It's it's uh, it, you know it it it's about lots of people. It's about um, you know just all sorts of uh, whether it be um, commercialism or industry, all these things. 
it's all going simultaneously. And I think that it was that conflagration of these two ideals that really sparked my work. So a good example would be um, uh, visiting a Confucian temple in old Shanghai and spending about an hour within this temple in its gardens, uh, looking at and sketching these incredible rocks um, and how they're displayed. It was, uh, you know, quiet, it was cool. Um, it just, you know, put you in this place mentally. And then when I left and the doors of the um, temple opened up and I'm bang, just shocked to be entering modern Shanghai with, with its stores and the people and the noise and the smells and everything just hitting you. The air is so dense and thick and it was just just a shock to the senses. And that just continued no matter where I went. And I realized that it is that mixture of these two cultures, these two worlds that had to be part of uh, what I would see in a scholar's rock. And so if we go to the next slide, when I returned to the States, the work that I started to create was in my mind, this kind of, this clash, this, this, this mixture of these two worlds of um, that kind of perfect nature, uh, which includes, you know, uh, balance and composition and natural materials that we find in the stones. And then that kind of, for, for lack of a better word, maybe chaos that, that we find in this kind of modern world that was surrounding it, you know, with color and um, text and, uh, you know, using materials uh, man-made, in, in this case, um, cast aluminum, um, which is zinc plated. So the work became this montage of these two different senses. Um, and you can see both these pieces, uh, a little bit of all of that um, happening. Um, I thought it was interesting when Jan mentions the actual rock versus an artist's interpretation of the actual rock. And I think that that's exactly kind of what I'm doing. It's like this interpretation, bringing everything that is surrounding me into the stones. So there's a little connections to tradition, talking about you know the stands that Jan brought up. You can see on the image on the uh, right there that the kind of a traditional stand, though it's, it's made in ceramic. If we go to the next slide, the idea is kind of continued um, in this body of work. Um, and these are good examples. Again, my reference to the stones would be the sense of balance. You know, some of those characteristics of, of Shu and uh, Lu and Tu are all in here, but they're in, in uh, you know, contemporary, almost industrial material, um, you know, still working on that balance and composition. So here we have, again, either cast bronze or aluminum that's nickel plated, um, text being painted on, uh, epoxies, cast concrete. Again, just feeling like that scholar's rock uh, form, but having that, you know, one foot in the modern and one foot in the natural. And then the final two images that I'll share with you are uh, works that are in the uh, exhibit. Um, here, the, the, the works that are included here are a few years uh, beyond the last images. But when I started to play with this idea of actually casting um, what felt like scholars rocks, but using these more industrial materials. So uh, the stone that you see here is cast concrete. Um, and if you get close, you'll see uh, wire, steel wires and steel rod that are exposed. So, you know, it is still anchored in that now, uh, though it seems natural. And the same with the stand. The stand has a feels like uh, a traditional stand that you might find uh, a scholar's rock on, yet it's made of material that is untraditional. This particular stand has, happens to be made from um, a discarded couch of all things, uh, molding, refurbished, uh, material cut, and then these bright, gaudy kind of uh, modern colors and epoxy. 
And the last image is along the same lines. You know, this cast uh, concrete rock on top uh, of a base that seems to speak more of the contemporary of the modern, um, using again, those industrial materials, um, parts of a door, plywood, painted, um, geometric being more uh, of the modern sense. So, you know, it, these works were a way for me to feel like I was um, touching on the traditional and yet, you know, anchored uh, as well in the contemporary world that I'm in. So that's it. Thank you, Chris. And Absolutely. on the right is just kind of an installation shot that shows um, how his Absolutely. works are presented in the show. So thank you for loaning your work to this show. And um, thank you for those remarks. And um, now I think Susan Meyer is going to share her work with us. Great. And I also wanted to thank Donna for her incredible job curating and the hard work that it took. And I wanted to thank the fellow artists and fellow panelists. I'm delighted to be alongside you. And I also wanted to thank the Korean Cultural Center. I'm just honored to be showing in the Korea Gallery. Um, if we could go to the first slide. Yep. I, had, I had been working with um, imagery based on kind of rock forms for quite a while. And I thought, oh, this is the work in the show. <laughs> yeah, this, sorry, this is just your title slide. Um, you wanna go to the next one? Yeah. Okay, great, here we go. And I thought I would just um, go over the previous body of work just briefly. Um, on the left is Mitzi, and Mitzi is one of four sculptures that used um, the idea of scholars' rocks and sort of conflated them with um, the idea of female Borscht Belt comics. So <laughs> um, there was Joan Rivers, and it kind of started with Joan Rivers' death, and I was working on a stone, and it sort of sp spoke to me as, as Joan, in a way, um, not literally, but... And so Joan Rivers, um, there was Phyllis Diller, um, Barbara for Barbara Streisand, who played Fanny Bryce in two films, who was a um, Borschbell comic. And then this is Mitzi, a fictitious um, Borschbell comic. And you might ask, why would I conflate Borschbell comic, female Borschbell comics specifically with scholars' um, stones? And part of that is the idea of the scholar stone being this transformative. Um, object that makes us think of larger nature, but also inspires the scholar or artist to create works. And I also thought of the female Borschtbelt comics as people who were transforming the roles of women at their time period and kind of inspiring um, and so on. And again, the death of Joan Rivers kind of um, got the whole thing rolling. So after making these um, these Borschtbell comic scholar stones, I decided that I wanted to move somewhat away. I had been making work that had a lot of stacking in it and this density that you see in the piece on the left. Um, and I wanted to move away from that a little bit. And I decided that I would jettison a lot of ideas that I had previously used and told my students to use involving making models. And you know, the only way to really figure out a three-dimensional thing is to make a model because it has three-dimensional space. Um, instead, I decided to throw that out the window and work directly from a small, um, very two-dimensional sketch. Um, and by small, it's three inches by four inches. And it's really like a doodle-like sketch. So I used that sketch um, to create Transformer, which is the piece on the right. And you can see on the sketch, these little marks where I'm, I'm kind of going along and marking off, okay, I got that one. You know, I got that line addressed in a three-dimensional way. Um, what ends up is the piece Transformer. Um, and Transformer does include a small rock-like form. It's not a rock, but, um, and it's a very sim simple rock. It's not um, a scholar's rock in, in the way that it, it isn't complex like that, um, but it sits in this little chamber or, or hangs in this little chamber. And there's something of the notion, I think, of that chamber perhaps having the potential to transform it or by, by proxy us in some way. 
And then I also felt that the sculpture looked a little figurative and also a little mechanical. And it looked um, somewhat mid motion to me, like it's a, and if, it, if it's a motion, it's a lurching motion. And I thought about those um, transformer toys that go from superheroes into cars and it being something of that. And then I also think, and part of the reason I use um, the idea of Scholar's Rocks is that they're doing a lot what we're hoping that art does as both a practice as artists, but also as objects. Um, we hope that they will transform us and, and transform the viewer in some way. So next slide. Um, this piece is called Venus and it was made in a similar way. The little sketches on the left-hand side. Venus includes some Barbara Streisand imagery from this particular um, album cover. There are some eyes and lips that you can see um, collaged on some of the slats, particularly you can see them on the right-hand slide. Um, and uh, actually on the right-hand slide off to the behind the little figure. But, but the form, the overall form of the piece Venus, I think speaks, and particularly in the context of this show, um, speaks to me of the shape of a scholar's rock as if it's the, the exterior shape is the scholar's rock and the scholar is sitting within it. Um, and while the piece is named Venus and the exterior has quite a um, lush and sort of seductive look, the small figure who is decidedly female is not your typical Venus. <laughs> um, she's a very worried um, and concerned figure kind of lost in her own thoughts and not, not activating the thoughts of the viewer perhaps in, in the way a Venus might. Um, and I made this piece during the middle of, you know, the Trump administration and, and the figure itself probably reflect, reflects a lot of the concerns I was feeling and the state of mind I was in at certain times um, in the past four years. Next image. Um, then we move on to Plinth, which is also in the show. And this piece, I think, directly does reference the idea of Scholar's Rock stands. Um, so Plinth is this very elaborate structure on which some sort of stands in for stand-ins for scholar's stones either sit or rest within. It's also from a tiny little drawing. In the drawing, I thought of it almost like on a rope on that very end where one might in sort of a Sisyphean way be dragging this like baggage behind them. And the palette of plinth kind of follows sort of a spring, summer, winter, spring, summer, fall, winter palette. I also have this little image done on the right of a previous show that plinth was in. And I thought it was interesting in the context of the theme of this talk that um, in that show, it was in a very different context in a very different lighting situation with a very different um, type of group of works, 50 artists from a particular region. And I think that that, that framing, you know, that curatorial framing and what it has done to the viewers who have viewed it versus the curatorial framing in this show are kind of interesting things as an artist to contemplate. And then the next slide, um, and this, these are just some close-ups of the sort of um, proxies for Scholar's Rocks that sit on this, um, on plinth. Some of them very offhand, like that little guy in the middle top is just air dried clay and spray paint. And some of them, um, not as that offhand to make, but I think they get across kind of a, an offhand in comparison to the elaborate stand that they sit on. And that's, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Susan. That was wonderful. Um, I love your um, rock figures, portraits of the Borshmo comedians. Um, so we'll come, we'll come back to what that all means in a minute. Um, Craig Yee, would you like to go next? Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, first, I would also like to thank Donna. I would like to thank the Korean Cultural Center and then all the artists and presenters. But in addition, I want to make a plug for uh, not just the show, but the incredible online program that Donna and the Cultural, Cultural Center have put together. Uh, I've just spent the last week going through all the presentations, all the presenters, all the artists. It's, inc it's an incredible repository 
of ideas. Uh, I think it represents the best of what we actually can do online. And I would, my hope actually is this, this show continues on travels in some form and actually travels to East Asia, travels to Korea, travels to China, travels to Japan. Uh, and I, I hope these artists and their artworks get a showing in that context. And that brings me to the question of stand. Uh, what does a curator do but create a context in which artwork is seen? Um, very much like a stand creates a context in which a specific rock is seen. Uh, and uh, we're doing this in New York. So there are a lot of presenters who are presenting classical East Asian ideas because this is what we lack. Okay, uh, when, we, when we need to, or we want to interpret the works of these contemporary artists. Um, if we were to go and take these artists to Korea or to Japan, I think we would need to create a new stand. The artworks can be the same, the artists can be the same, but I would love to see what the digital program looks like um, when we present the artists in Seoul or in Tokyo or Kyoto, um, what have you. So there are a couple of things I would like to address. Um, you know, what I do is I uh, try and present contemporary artists, but I try and present them with the full or as much of the historic context as I think is necessary to, to, to kind of realize the potential that contemporary artists who work in this either traditional contemporary or East-West dialogue, the opportunities they present us. And I think that curators are oftentimes very scared of doing this because, you know, we go to the art academies and then we're educated in all these theoretical frameworks and our whole discourse is in this theoretical framework. But then now all of a sudden I'm meeting an artist who's dragging me into all these other contexts. I'm not an expert. So how on earth can I actually speak as an expert to these contexts? And, you know, my answer is simple. It's just like, relax, okay, let go and follow the artists and then research your butt off afterwards in order to catch up so that you can say something informed at the very least based on what the artist is telling you. So I, I'm just gonna go through and list a bunch of topics that have come up for me as I've listened to these talks. One, the human nature relationship, okay. Two, this question of time and process, okay? The rock, this eternal thing, and yet it's supposed to be dynamic and moving and changing. So the immediate moment, change and transformation and eternity, all there in one. The idea of the universe within the small or the small within the universe, this kind of relationship seems to be central to a lot of ideas that people are dealing with. Um, this other notion, a portal, somehow the rock being a portal into another world. How does that work? Okay, and what worlds are we going into? The fact that we ended up with the Borscht Belt comics is just blows my mind. And yet there's precedent for it when you think about the Monkey King or you think of Jia Baoyu and the story of the stone as, as being these fictitional but then mythical characters that we enter into through the notion of the stone. Um, the notion of collecting, which is also a form of curation. Okay, we've met great collectors actually in this panel. We've talked about the influence of great collectors. The stories of the stones are oftentimes the stories as told by great collectors. How do these objects become deemed artworks? Actually, it's the collectors who deem them artworks. So somehow the role of the collector is thrown into this. This question of abstraction, these are concrete objects. Why are we talking about abstraction? Okay, and yet, we are. <laughs> many, many times this has shown up in the discussions. What is going on? Okay, when we're looking at a concrete object and everybody instinctually starts talking about abstraction. That's weird, okay? Um, so the first thing I wanna start with is we, when we talk about nature, we're talking actually about a concept of nature which I think is very familiar to all of us, but maybe a little bit alien to our cultural tradition, but very, very compatible with the way we're looking at nature today scientifically. Okay, uh, the Chinese notion of nature doesn't start with like a God on high and then human beings formed in the image of nature. And then we've got all, uh, in, in the image of God and then we have nature below us, which is there to basically serve the needs of man, right? That's not the East Asian notion of nature. The East Asian, Asian notion of nature, there's a saying, tian ren he yi, which is uh, human, humanity, ren, okay, and then nature, tian, okay, are really one thing, okay, so that basic notion. Furthermore, you can talk about this hierarchical relationship. Actually, the, the Chinese notion of the world is called wang wu, which is 10,000 things, okay, not a hierarchy of different things, but the 10,000 things, meaning all things that exist in the universe 
are essentially the same kind of thing. There is no category, hierarchy of categories in the Chinese natural world. We're all things and we all exist together, okay? So a rock is a thing, I'm a thing, a society is a thing, a building is a thing, a market is a thing. All these are things and we're all on the same ontological level, right? Now, what is a thing? A thing is actually not an object that fits within a hierarchy of categories. An object actually is a process. So this whole note process has come up, change has come up, time and duration has come up. This is intrinsic to the Chinese notion of what nature is. It's a thing, but a thing is actually a process that's unfolding, okay? So that's a starting point, right? When we talk about nature, that's our starting point. So how does the scholar's rock fit into that? Well, a lot of the ideas I described are oftentimes attributed to Taoism, but they're just as true as a Confucian worldview. It's just that the Confucians narrow their worldview and they say, yeah, 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 there's nature and nature out there, but really what we're concerned with is how societies function. So what we care about are human beings, we care about human societies, and even though that's all a reflection of nature and nature, we can restrict our discussion and start our discussion with a discussion of human nature, okay? And so Confucians narrow their focus to that. And they also look at you, starting with this view of nature, as a process that's unfolding, okay? So the, the, the fundamental question that Confucians ask is, we wanna influence the way a society functions because if we can influence the way societies function, we can create a lot of human good doing that. But the starting point is to say, well, if that's a process that's unfolding, but it's made up of a bunch of us, okay? And we're all processes unfolding. So how do we influence our process of unfolding so that we become morally and spiritually complete human beings. And that's what Confucians are concerned with, okay? And they created this thing in the early, early times called the six arts. So the way in which you actually influence your development as a process into becoming a complete human being is actually through the arts. So everybody talks about, oh, we know Chinese and East Asians are so obsessed with education. That's kind of a good thing, good for them. Actually, the origin of that is an appreciation of the arts. Uh, education is valued because education turns you into a full human being. It's not just a matter of getting ahead and getting a degree and getting a good job. It's really about becoming a complete human being. And the original curriculum was the arts. So that's why we value the arts. Okay, now let's keep getting back to the scholars rock. Another issue that came up was the garden. Okay, so the scholars rocks appear in gardens. Well, it turns out that the garden precedes the rock. We care about the rocks because we care about gardens. And Jan Stewart in a previous lecture puts up the, the origins of the character for, um, for garden and in it are a tree because it's got to have that living organic component. Water, we talk so much, you know, if we're talking about rocks, what we haven't talked about is water and water is the other great metaphor if you're going to talk about nature and pretty much anything else in the universe in, in a Chinese philosophical context. But then the third character is mountain, okay? And that in a rock, con in, a, in a garden context is represented by the rock, okay? So that's an essential element in what a garden is. Now, what is a garden? A scholar's garden was invented in a way as an experience or as an art form, okay, in the sixth dynasties period, which happens after the Han. This is roughly third century to sixth century AD, okay? The Han Dynasty was this period in which Confucianism reigned as kind of state orthodoxy. And then the sixth dynasties afterwards was a period in which Confucians and, the, and society was a fragmented period, questioned this and started to say, well, what are we missing? Okay, why didn't this work? What failed in this idea of a, a state Confucian orthodoxy? And the answer was we're missing Taoism. Okay, so the philosophy of the sixth dynasty said, wait a minute, we need to go back to this question of what the human relationship is to nature. And the idea is if I'm a Confucian, I'm there, I'm, I've raised myself to be a morally good human being, I'm serving society in order to create a harmonious and stable society. How do I do that? The answer is you need something that takes you out of the Confucian world, that takes you out of the social world, that takes you out of the world of structure and hierarchy and gives you a place outside of that a space where you can develop yourself and transfer yourself to another point of view that allows you to look at this man-made system and say, I can change that, I can transform that. If you're within the system, how do you gain that point of view necessary to transform things? It's only outside the system that you can look at it and understand it, understand its underlying principles and help guide its development. 
And that position is the position of the natural world. How do you get that? Well, the original Taoists, they went off into the mountains. We call them mountain people. The immortals are the people who live off in the mountains, okay? And, and the, this is how you understand nature is you live with nature in order to do that. But I'm stuck in the city, I'm a Confucian. I'm here responsible for whatever it happens to be in society. How do I do this? You bring the garden into the city. Christopher Foss's experience of being in the garden and then boom, right outside the door, there's the, the hurly burly of a city, right? And what he experienced is exactly what the Confucian scholars were trying to experience. In the hurly-burly of the city, how do I bring a slice of nature? Because we're all a process, meaning we're all in development. How do we shape our development? Through our daily experiences, our embodied experiences. How do we get that embodied experience of nature when we can't go off into the mountains? We bring it into the city in the form of a garden. And the scholar's raw then becomes the manifestation of that in the form of collection and in the form of an object of contemplation and meditation. Okay. So the one thing I want to encourage people to do is to not just look at these as exotic, esoteric ideas from another culture in another time, but as really prescriptions for how you're supposed to engage with these objects through prolonged contemplation and meditation. How does it function as a portal? As Susan was talking about, it functions as a portal through your mental engagement with the object and it takes time. Okay, so it's not a matter of walking through a museum, engaging with a rock and just saying, oh, how nice and walking on. It really is. If you were a collector of the rock and you lived with it, you could spend hours meditating on that rock. Okay? And in those hours, then this alternate world opens up. So it's prolonged engagement, embodied experience over an extended period, ideal of a lifetime that results in the transformation. Now, how does this fit into what the artists are doing? All I would say is this, is I can sit in front of a rock, meditate, and boy, you know, all kinds of things can open up for me. Okay? But guess what? It just all sits in here. Now, I benefit from that. That's a lovely thing. As the Confucians would want, or as the owners of the inventors of the Scholar's Garden would want, it does transform me, and that's the objective. But if I'm an artist, I can take that inspiration and actually create something else which for another person becomes an experience. This is the power that artists have that ordinary, us ordinary lovers of art don't have, okay? So we can appreciate, but we don't create the object, which then becomes an experience for somebody else. And that's where the artists are absolutely unique in our world, in our society, okay? Bring it back to curation, right? What are the artists doing, okay? The artists are essentially taking their life experiences and they're transforming them into objects. What do we do as viewers? We're essentially making a choice when we go out to view art. When we view art, we're choosing to spend time with this and not spending time with that. Every act of viewing a work of art actually is an act of curation, okay? But what are we curating and then what do we produce from that curation? We curate a series of embodied experiences just as a scholar who's collecting rocks curates a series of embodied experiences or in designing their own garden is curating a garden they're gonna live with, okay, in their daily life. We're curating these experiences. What is the product? The product is us. You are the product of your act of curation, right? Now, the artists get to do another thing. They get to create experiences for us, right? And we get to choose in viewing their works, which of those artists and those works we wanna bring into to create us to create yourself. And all I have to say is, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Donna invited me in, into this show. After seeing all the presentations and seeing the artists, wow, what an act of curation. And I, you know, it, I would be so disappointed if this show didn't travel, okay? And more people wouldn't be able to experience, you know, what is out there in the selection of these artists and their artworks. So that's how I'm gonna say today. Thank you so much. That was really brilliant. I think you tied it all together. And I also um, am hoping the show will travel. Um, I was mentioning earlier amongst our panelists, I've been invited to make a write-up of uh, the experience of curating the show, the artworks, and the. Um, I'm going to be using the structure of these five conversations in my articles. So you can look for that 
in the future on any of my social media channels. Um, the Korean Cultural Center will be publishing all of these recordings on their YouTube channel, on their social media. So you'll have an opportunity to relive this, um, sh you know, share it with your friends. And um, I just wanna thank our panelists tonight for being with us. We're just about out of time. And I don't know if um, Director Joe wanted to say any closing remarks to us tonight. Um, again, we're just so fortunate to have the exhibition hosted at the Korean Cultural Center to New York and for their platform to host and edit and reproduce all, and archive all of these um, online Zoom discussions. Um, thank you, Donna. Um, I'm I really thank you everybody uh, who participated in uh, today's discussion. And I uh, really appreciate the, uh, Ms. John Stewart's great remark and uh, Greg is a uh, I mean, I mean, brilliant idea. And two participating artists, Mr. Frost and Ms. Meyer uh, for your uh, excellent art piece in our exhibition. And this might be a very small step forward for our, our Korean Culture Center in New York, but I hope this will be the great leap for American uh, uh, art world in the coming future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. I think um, that's a wrap as they say. And um, I hope you'll join us um, online. I was also just gonna put in my um, email. If anyone had any follow-up, you're welcome to be in touch with me. And um, I am just, so pleased you joined us tonight and um, thanks for all these provocative conversations. Thanks for the opportunity to curate this show. Thanks to all the artists who've loaned their work and participated in these talks. And thank you, Jan Stewart and Craig Yee for coming together to this conversation. Um, I love this community that we've created amongst many diverse curators in this field. So thanks for joining us tonight from Seattle and Washington, DC. And with that, I'll just say good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Thank you.